So let's go ahead and begin. When Wendy asked me to talk with you, uh, one of the things that she really wanted me to emphasize was sort of that daily living activity, being alive with your children, and sometimes it's hard, isn't it? And then also the learning strategies, so that those of you that are professionals, teachers, um, therapists, that I hopefully can offer some suggestions related to strategies, because it's great to have all of the, the ideas uh, kind of floating around. You can read those anywhere, but then what do you really do with these guys and what helps with these guys, right? Meaning everyone, not just guys and, gir guys and girls. So again, um, that's what I, I intend to focus on tonight. And just to kind of give you an idea of what the presentation will sort of cover, what we have now uh, that we didn't have many years ago is more translational research, which means that it translates the science into the doing, the people that are actually working with these kids and strategies that will help them. And so again, most of what I'm going to share tonight is really going to um, give you an idea of where it came from in terms of brain, the brains of these individuals, kind of what makes them tick, so to speak, and what sort of sets them off based on science. And again, it's really important to get this message because Sometimes we're going to think that our children are acting out and sort of bratty and sort of just doing things to get our attention. And yet, when we really roll this back and we look at the science behind it, we're going to know that there's really a reason for this, that the hardwiring in their brain precludes them from doing certain things easily. And so if we can give them a little lift and a little bit of a, a strategy to help them along, then oftentimes we're able to get them beyond what we would uh, normally be, be experiencing with them. And so again, the phenotype just simply means what we know uh, from science and um, what we really need to pull from this is then some ideas about structuring the environment uh, at home and in the classroom. I've tried to structure this so that those of you that are in schools or in therapies uh, will also benefit from what I'm talking about related to the home environment. And then what are you know the, the needs based on the phenotype? So we'll decide kind of based on science what the needs are and then how we're going to create this environment to learn how do we design the intervention process. So again, really trying to bring it back to the brain and um, the hardwiring, so to speak, of these individuals and how can we help them? Because I know all of you know this about your kids or children that you work with they have all this information and yet when we test them or we get a test back from some evaluator it's like nothing you know it they're untestable or uh, the the IQ is really low and sure I mean all of us would like our kids I, I am sure to have normal IQ but the point is it's a lot of times uh, their functioning is so much higher at home or somewhere else than we would normally see in that number right and and so or they're really good at something they're almost savant at some point so they can remember something and all these facts and and all these these music titles or you know whatever they're into um, and yet they can't really tell you what one in three is right in terms of math so again that's kind of hard it's really hard to reconcile that because we know that they have some capability and and yet it's really hard for us to get those numbers when it comes to testing. So that's why I want to share with you some strategies that I think really will help bring that, kind of close that gap. So again, here's what we know about the brain. Um, we know that there is this protein that they still call FMRP, which means um, mental retardation um, protein, which I wish they get, get rid of that, but anyway, that's part of what we call it. Uh, but anyway, this protein is really important, and this protein plays a role in all of the pre- and postnatal brain development. And so again, because this protein is lacking in individuals with fragile X, some have a little bit of the protein, some have not very much at all, um, it really affects cognition and learning. So again, this, when this gene turns off the, the protein production, then we get into some problems with learning. Again, it regulates the other genes and proteins. So again, if we have no protein or reduced amount of protein, then we're going to have abnormal neural development. Okay? So this is what we kind of uh, look at when, when we look at these individuals. We know that these are the areas that are really affected. Uh, by that protein and the overabundance of improper, improper and over 
active neural connections. Again, I'll show you a little slide in a second and you'll see the difference that in a normal brain, some of those dendrites really are nicely tied together and then in the brain of one with fragile X, we see these really uh, splintered branches. Uh, so again, if we have this connection issue, then we know that in the amygdala, where we saw earlier, you can see it up here, the amygdala, I guess you can't see that, I've got a cursor, but you, in the amygdala, we see that's the problem with anxiety. And so many of our guys and girls uh, have a great deal of anxiety, right? So there's the brain science right behind it. We don't have to go any further. We know that this is the problem there. We also know that the weaken uh, in the cortex and hippocampus kind of contributes to that short-term memory and attentional control. Let's go take a look at that again. So again, you can see um, the hippocampus, the cortex, those are areas uh, that really don't have great connections, connectedness, and so again, we're going to see more of that intention, attentional control uh, being an issue, and a lot of you know that. Um, your kids can kind of attend to something for a while and maybe five minutes and they're gone, right? They're out of, into something else. Or they can attend to something they're highly interested in for quite a while, right? <laughs> and I think we're all built that way, aren't we? <laughs> there's some things that really keep our attention and there's other things that really tax us. And then the, the last one is the weakened frontal lobe. And we know that that's hyperactivity and the executive functioning. Now, executive functioning is something that we talk a lot about in the United States. I'm sure you're doing it here too. And really that's forming up a plan and executing, starting, okay? And if it doesn't work, then you kind of regroup and you look again for another solution. Well, they try the same solution over and over and over and over and they get stuck and they get frustrated and they're done, right? Or they failed at it before so they don't get started. And you're like, come on, come on. And I've seen kids that need to write their name and the pencil goes like this over and over again. It's kind of like, are you stalling out on me for a reason or what is, well, I don't know what to do is what he really wants to tell you, right? I don't know how to start. I don't know where you want me to write this. I don't remember how to make the first letter of my name. Um, it's, that's tough. So that's the executive functioning. Here's, here's what I was talking about earlier with the, the uh, spines, the dendritic spines. And so you see that in the top one, um, that's a human being affected by fragile X. And do you see how um, highly dense it is? And the pruning process doesn't take effect until when, when you see the bottom one, you can see where it is. Um, in an unaffected brain, kind of smooth, and those dendrites are pruned. And so again, we don't have all that craziness going on that really affects the connectedness of those um, places in the brain. It's sort of like when you take a look at a fuse box that is connected in a very strange way, going all kinds of areas there. You can see what's happening here. Um, it's highly difficult. Uh, to really engage in any learning or executive functioning when your brain kind of reminds you of this fuse box. And so what we want to do is to put something together for them, create the structure that they need so that they then can utilize everything that's good about their brain and bring it to the forefront so that they can bring it to us and, and address some of those issues that uh, we've brought to mind. So again, uh, that's kind of the goal. Uh, of us as educators, as psychologists, as therapists, to do a better job with that. We know that there's a profile that's been studied many, many times and replicated in the literature that we have this cognitive profile with strengths, okay, vocabulary, and we know that, don't we? Because sometimes with their talking, they can talk to us about all kinds of things, and even when they've overheard something in a conversation, they bring it back in, in the appropriate place, and use that word. They use that word just perfectly, don't they? And so again, we know that that's happening. So they need that context around it, though. They really need to understand um, kind of the narrative. So when you're talking and you're using those words, then they have the context. Um, and then the long-term memory for high interest. They can talk about things they did a while ago and things they were interested in. It's pretty amazing. And something can kind of strike their memory and all of a sudden they're talking about a vacation that you took two years ago in great detail, right? So again, that's really important. They really read our, our emotions in our face. So those of us that have been frustrated with kids with fragile X and kind of lose it at times because we're human, they read that very well. And um, even if you're trying really hard to keep that neutral, 
voice going and your face, you know, they kind of get it through their skin. It's amazing how, how well they respond to that and how well they read that face and that emotion. The weaknesses, again, attentional control, we know that and we know that from the, the brain work that people have, have done. Also the linguistic processing. So again, it kind of takes a while for them to process the information. Um, visual motor impairment, motor planning, really hard, isn't it? They want to write so much or they want to take notes and do things that everyone else does and yet it's really hard for them to get it down in writing, to remember how to form an M, how to form an O. Lower IQ scores are reported, of course, and then also the executive functioning deficits. So again, if you want to take pictures of my slides, I'm great with that. That's not a problem on your phone. What I can't let you do is take pictures of kids. So just try to remember that. So if you see a slide that has kids in it, um, try not to take a picture of that slide. Wendy and I talked about having it posted so that we can go back and maybe my slides, we can take out the pictures of kids in the slides and then you can download them too. So we've got a couple of things going to give you an opportunity um, to, to, to know more about, well, to have these available to you. Um, so the cognitive, these is, this is old research, but guess what? It's been replicated many, many times. These are the originals. I like to always give them credit for it because they're the ones that came up with those strengths that we had earlier in the slide before and the weaknesses. So again, um, looking at that uh, weakness in intentional control and all the processing aspects, the visual spatial cognition, those are the actual uh, research articles and research that's been done in those areas. So now I want to show you, this is a picture coming up, so please don't take a picture of it. I want to show you something that's going to be reminiscent probably of your kids. Uh, this is a young man who has been reinforced many times for his verbal skills, and so we kind of get sidelined, don't we, and with these guys, they, they kind of come up and start talking about different things, and you pay attention to that, and you sort of get tracked into a different area, and then you're trying to get the focus back on the learning, right? It's a little bit tricky. So anyway, this is a, a really good example of that. This is all the sound we have, so. Remember, we're not shuffling, we're just looking at the words. <laughs> that looks familiar, doesn't it? Ready? My foot, my foot, my foot, my foot, my foot. So the foot hurts, you know, there's a million things. We'll talk about band-aid later. Box. Mm -mm. Look at the word. Elbow. Close. Close. Get rid of that elbow. Thank you. Wait. Put your box. Just one word. Good. good job. Nice, good. nice. Uh -huh. Nope, you get to shop a lot when you do a good job with this. She mm -hmm. uh, See? She? That's right. Nice oh, job. Oh, I heard it. Oh, we're still thinking. You yeah. never hear it. That's it. So it's almost like you. Let me just stop that a second. One of the things that we know about these guys is that when you get pretty excited with them, they get hyper aroused, right? And so it's kind of hard because you want to reinforce them, but then they're off the charts and you're like, what did I just create, right? I'm trying to tell him he did a good job. Do you notice how many times he's going cyclical into these other extraneous sorts of things? Because that's becoming habituated with him. He talks about all these kinds of things and guess what? It's reinforced because then somebody responds to that. So we have to get him focused back down on the reading and try to do, you know, our best job to eliminate some of the extraneous you stuff. You're not listening. We lose a marble. Did it back? How are you going to get it back? Let it back. That's right. Ready? So again, we're going back a bit, but I wanted you to know he was working for marbles and he fills up a, a little... A jar with the marbles and then he gets a reinforcer. That's kind of what we worked out for him. But see all the extraneous movement and all the things that he's doing? So we're trying to hone in on that learning to read and paying attention to that stimuli. And why does she care about the elbow? Because his muscle tone is really low and he's going to just sort of fade into the countertop, right? So again, um, this is a, an interesting case where a kid was extremely his his um, behavior was really um, difficult for the school district to deal with and so they put him on a homebound we call it in in Colorado and in the states 
put him on a homebound schedule so that he had tutoring at home. And it had to be very specific to him and his needs. And so this is a, one of the tutors that I've trained uh, that was working with him uh, at home because he couldn't go to school any longer. He was so violent and had so many issues. So again, uh, trying to get him kind of back in the fold again and then back into a school. And actually, after we got him to a point where we knew that he was steady, and his data looked pretty good in terms of his aggressive behavior being reduced dramatically, then he was able to go actually to a private school and the school district paid the tuition to the private school because in the United States we say if the, the school district cannot handle or meet the needs of a child, then uh, the school district is responsible for whatever placement uh, we put into place. So again, uh, looking at the research again, you see all of these things that we saw before the visual motor impairments and all of those things, the task requiring psychomotor coordination. And what they did with this study is they looked at biological uh, issues, the amount of protein that was produced, and they also looked at environmental factors. So um, that was actually together uh, what predicted the outcome. So again, just as important as how much protein your child does or doesn't produce is the environment and the way we teach them. So again, we kind of know that there is a deficiency in the protein. So there's not much we can do about that. Hopefully someday we can, they're working on it, they're trying to figure out ways to replace that protein. But at this point in time, what we want to do is look at that environment, right? Because the, the researchers said that's as important as the lack of protein. So that's what we have, that's our job here and now, and that's our job to, pro to provide that protein, <laughs> yeah, I wish, provide the environment so that they can uh, do really well. So again, uh, the depletion of the protein was correlated with lower IQ scores in males. Again, that was something that um, they had, had really researched, and then the depletion was uh, related to slow processing speed, poor short-term memory, and attentional dysregulation. Again, just reiterating some of this, these pieces of research that have been replicated over and over again. If we look at a cognitive phenotype, it's kind of hard to understand sequential and, and simultaneous processing. Sequential is the obvious, right? A, B, C, D. And a lot of times when we're teaching reading, we teach phonics that way. So we teach a sound and then we blend into another sound, right? Yeah. But simultaneous is the whole. So when you look at that chart of A, B, C, D, they are seeing not A, then B, then C, then D. They see the whole thing. They see A, B, C, D as a whole. Um, one of the things that we know is that they can learn to read that way much better than phonetically. Some of the kids can handle phonics, uh, but generally speaking, they're sort of hung up on that for a while and they sort of lose time in terms of reading. And I think what's really helpful is to give them that skill early on so they can kind of look at their peers and decide, I can read too, right? Because we know they're very much aware of their peers, their environment, and everything going on. They know that they're not maybe performing to the level that their peers are. They know this. And so again, it's pretty frustrating for them, right? They also get embarrassed when they make mistakes. And people, I think, don't understand that about this population. They truly do get very embarrassed. And sometimes, even though they don't say it to you, they certainly do act like they're embarrassed. Or they may hit at you. Um, suddenly, you're going to get hit. And you're like, what just happened? You know, I thought we were doing OK. Oh, I had to correct him. We, he didn't get this answer right. We kind of had to redo this. No wonder. So again, those are things that are really important to them. Simultaneous processing, here's a great example of that. This is a guy in Germany, so it happens everywhere, folks. <laughs> um, he has to have something in his mouth to chew. He's on his phone, and he's got the computer going. Does that look familiar? <laughs> I mean, you're thinking, how much stimuli can this guy handle, right, coming into him uh, and his sensory system and his processing? But again, this is what they like. I'm not saying it's always good for them in terms of learning, but that's kind of just their go-to. They like lots of, inf lots of information coming from, uh, to, to them. If we look at the simultaneous part then, you'll see that we've got the gestalt configuration, meaning the whole, right? Then we also have that global conception. So they're going to see something and remember the whole. That's why visually they're so much better, because they can really look at a picture and remember what's in that picture. But talking to them about it without a picture may not set up quite as much uh, in terms of the memory. They're very intuitive. They organize things intuitively. And any of you that have tested these kinds of kids, you think, 
uh, wait a minute, they're going really fast. He's really impulsive. He's going to get it all wrong, and suddenly it's right. So again, it's, it's that sort of different way of processing and, and organizing. They get multiple stimuli at one time coming at them, and they also now uh, have that visual memory for the whole. It's better than the parts. So again, that's gestalt. That's the whole instead of the parts, right? So you're going to look at words and you're going to see the whole word. You're not going to see the first sound and the middle sound and the end sound. Um, now, if we kind of look at what's going on as far as daily living uh, and learning, I kind of wanted to tie this all together with those of you uh, who are parents so that you know, I can help you with the, the daily living skills. And I think um, we already know this, you've lived it, but a noisy environment is pretty difficult for these guys. And we're going to um, kind of get them from zero to 100 pretty fast. When that environment is noisy, chaotic, doesn't make a lot of sense to them. And it even may seem that they're enjoying it. It really does sometimes look like they're enjoying it, but then they have a meltdown a little bit later, right? And they kind of accumulate. We talked about that today. They accumulate those experiences. They kind of feel like they're holding it together. You think they're holding it together. And then all of a sudden, they lose it. Um, so again, that environment is really important. Those transitions, rough. I've got a couple of clips to show you kind of some strate strategies around those transitions. Um, they're everywhere. They're home. They're in the community. They're at school. Um, if they're not carefully orchestrated and we don't prepare them for those transitions, and you can't always because you don't know yourself sometimes, but those that we can control for, let's try to do that as much as possible. Um, and then we often, what happens is people stay home because the transitions are so hard that you say, okay, to your husband, you go ahead and take the rest of the kids. I'm going to stay home with John because it's just too hard for him to go to that restaurant or it's just too hard for him to go to that hockey game and watch his brother play. I'll just stay home. And so we kind of adjust our family units accordingly to make life a little bit easier, right? For us, for the child, uh, all the way around, and even the siblings. So again, you kind of have to take a look at that and wonder, is this the right way for me to structure my family? Do I need to introduce those opportunities with lots of support so that he can go to these things in the future? And really, it's kind of interesting because it's that approach avoidance. They kind of want to go, but then they don't want to go. And then they have a meltdown, and then they want to go, and they talk about it. And you're thinking, well, he's ready to go because that's all he's talked about, right, in the last hour? And you get ready to go in the car, and yeah. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. So again, that, that becomes problematic. And what's that about? That's that anxiety. So he really does want to go. He wants to be a part of the family because they're social beings. They love being with their family. Um, they definitely like to be included. And yet, they just can't muster up enough uh, to, to get themselves and their anxiety at bay so that they can go. And so they get frightened again, and then they melt down. Um, and then again, uh, what happens is that if we play into this too much, then they don't ever develop a way to deal with that noise, that clutter, that chaos. So again, we have to do it in a systematic fashion. You've already tried it the easy way, right? Not really the hard way. So let's just go to the hockey game. Okay, everybody's ready. Yeah, I want to go, I want to go, and we hear all this, and then all of a sudden they explode, they melt down. And what's happened then is that you're responsible for getting your other kid to a hockey game, and you've got this kid that's kind of not wanting to go, and what are you going to do, right? Do you call grandma? Do you have the neighbor? What do you do? Or do you take them screaming and kicking? So again, without a really good orchestrated way to handle that, like a visual schedule, a social story, some of those things that we could produce for him to get him used to this before the event even happens is really a good thing for him because you're going to get the prep and, and, and really have him ready for that situation so that he doesn't have to be so anxious. So how do we do that? It's kind of hard to overcome this. This is an exaggeration, but kids, you know, I mean, their bedrooms are pretty chaotic, they're kind of a mess, and yet then now all of a sudden we're putting in structure. So we have, we have this wonderful schedule, right? And he's going to follow every step of that schedule. That's a little bit tricky. So you're going to have to kind of pull that back and 
for sure, sometimes parents will say, well, you know, at school, he's really good. He seems to do all those things. He's got it all organized. Well, at school, things are pretty organized and specific because they have to be. You've got more than one kid in that classroom, and you're going to have to orchestrate some real structure to that environment, right, and predictability. So we can copy from school because it works well at school, and we can do it at home. And again, you're not going to be able to, to go from chaos into these schedules right away, but I, I would suggest one schedule. So if it's a routine for bed, let's go forward with something in visual pictures so that we can have that routine going and he knows exactly what's happening. Oftentimes I hear, well, he already has a routine set. He knows his routine. I know that because he goes and gets his pajamas, and then he goes to the shower, and then he comes out of the, the shower, and he goes into, he brushes his teeth, and then he goes to bed, whatever. He does it all in a sequence. He knows the routine. And that's true. But again, I always say, but if you have a schedule on your phone, and all of a sudden you forget your phone, even though you kind of know what your schedule is, it's pretty much the same, Kind of makes you nervous, doesn't it? Makes you a little bit anxious to think, oh, was it a 2 o'clock or a 2.30 appointment that I have this afternoon, okay? You need to go back and check that out. So they do too. It's comforting for them to have that schedule, even though they've habituated it, because guess what? When they get really anxious, they will forget the routine because they're going to be fighting the anxiety and they're not going to have the ability to remember the routine. So here's kind of a neurobiological underpinning in terms of factors that, that really impact daily living related transitions, okay? So we know that change is very difficult. When I did my dissertation research a thousand years ago, <laughs> not quite, um, I, I looked at checklists for kids that had autism and then kids with fragile X that didn't have autism. And so I looked at um, reporting from parents and the one thing, there were three factors that were extremely high in the population of those with Fragile X syndrome. And that was change in routine. It spiked higher than any of the kids um, that, that had autism. And we would think, you know, autism, they kind of get set and regimented. But these guys have more aversive reaction to a change in routine than their, their uh, peers or the control group that was autistic. So again, that's really important. Um, we know that. You live it. You know how hard that is. So again, this mom, here we are in front of our snow, snow, snow. That's all we get in Colorado anymore, it seems like. Um, so in front of my office, and she's bringing him into my office, and we've had some difficulty, and she said, I told him that Dr. Braden can look out her window, and if you don't get out of this car, she's going to come out here and get you. Well, thanks a lot. I just lost all of my rapport with this kid, right? But anyway, uh, coming into the office, really tough. He didn't want to transition, and he would bring the phone, and he would take mom's phone, all kinds of things, and he wanted to do all this, um, you know, kind of, basically, he was trying to tell me this is hard for me. I can't really transition this easily. It's really hard to walk into your office and do whatever. But his behavior was telling me that, right? So we get in, and um, let me show you this clip. So what I use is tokens, um, token boards, those of you that are familiar with them. I use a token for him, and um, I give him a token if he relinquishes his mom's phone, and if he's, then another one if he starts to come into the office. So we've worked into this. And at this point, this is what happens. So he's got to hug mom. Wait, wait, right here. So I'm showing him the token. Now he's going into the room to work. <laughs> you have to wave at the camera. Such a ham. Now, this is what I had him do next, and I always recommend this. So he's made one transition into the room, right? Um, I'm going to reinforce him for coming into the room. He gave mom the, the phone, and he's sitting down. Now I'm going to have him do a task that is a sorting task, because that's calming. He can organize that task. He can feel good about being productive. It's really easy for him. So don't think I'm teaching him anything new here, but I'm comforting him by letting him get into some routine and sorting at something that he's successful with. And um, people that are OCD sort of like to, to nice you know, buddy. sort things so and get things in order. With a very easy task because the transition is tough sometimes. And if you notice, 
there's some sifting going on, which is very typical of people with fragile X when they have sorting to do. But Logan is finding all of the, what color? Orange first. That's how he sorts. And this is very common as well. Now he's looking for yellow. Nice job, buddy. So again, I'm bringing him in. I'm giving him something he can be successful at. So we don't want to frustrate him, right, when he's kind of brought himself down to complying, right? We don't want to agitate him with something that's really hard. I'll bring that in after he's done the sorting and he's calm. Then when he finishes that day, um, and this isn't a video, he loves to check off what he's done, OK? So again, I write down what, and on, sometimes I'll do it on a whiteboard. This is on a sticky note. I'll write down five things we're going to do, okay? And that's how he's going to earn the five Batman tokens. And then after he finishes filling his board, he knows he can go out and see his mom. Try to kind of uh, finesse it so that it works just perfectly for the amount of time that he's there. So again, um, I'm giving him, okay, we're going to sort. And then we're going to do some reading and then whatever. And he checks off every time. Uh, he finishes one of those tasks. They love that. It's, it's just really a neat sort of clerical thing that they love to do. So again, oh, you came in, you sat down, check mark. Oh, you did your sorting, check mark. And so he, that's what he was doing there, and he really enjoys that and feels like some sense of accomplishment. The other thing that kind of happens in the family dynamics here um, is some of the unaffected, the neurotypical, uh, siblings get a little bit irritated uh, at, the, at the one with Fragile X, that they always have to sort of give in to their issues so that mom can avoid, right, a situation where um, they're going to lose it. So we kind of do rely on our neurotypical kids to kind of hang with us, right, and go with the flow, and yet they get pretty irritated too. And I do a lot of sibling groups, and they're able to tell me, not just uh, siblings of kids with Fragile X, but let's say autism, Down syndrome, whatever, and they get together and it's like, really? That happens to you too? Do you really hate your brother? Oh, I didn't mean hate, you know? And they get into that guilt about saying something terrible about their, their sibling, and yet they've got to have a place to dump it, right? They've got to have a place to share that. So again, that is a dynamic that is really heavy and, and um, powerful in our families because we know that that's going on with the other siblings. So again, that's another thing to kind of deal with in terms of this um, feeling guilty and sort of um, just going with the flow with the kid with Fragile X because it's so hard to change things for them. And so you just have to rely on your neurotypical kid and say, but you need to help me with this. You need to go along with this because you know how hard it is. Mom, he always gets to do whatever he wants. He always changes our plans. We never get to do, you know, you've heard it all. So again, I, it's a balancing act. It's really, really important for everyone to remember that both the, the child that's affected and the child that isn't affected have to have their say. They have to have sort of this e equal playing field. And so again, you're going to get into those situations where you're going to try really hard to say, okay, for you, this is what we're doing, and our kid with Fragile X is staying home, and we're going to go do this, and we're going to have our time. You kind of have to keep that um, even. And it's hard. It's very hard. So if they have communication delays, uh, again, this is something that's neurobiological. We know this based on the research. We're doing the translational research into your daily lives. Most behavior issues start because they can't communicate, right? So they're going to take care of things themselves. They're going to grab. They're going to crawl. They're going to climb. They're going to get it because it's easier to do that than for them to have to say a word, use their talker, whatever it is. They're just going to go take care of it themselves. <laughs> so again, once you stop, allowing them to just take care of the climbing and going and grabbing and whatever, and you put your hands up and you say, you know, and I'm at the cupboard and I'm not letting him into the cupboard. You're going to see some pretty good tantrums because he's been operating under this I can do it myself sort of thing and I don't have to do anything to get my need met. Um, and then you're going to be tempted when he starts to tantrum to let him go back to what he was doing before because it's kind of easier, right? So again, just remembering that every part of that is so important to communication. He is going to act out certain things in order for you to give in. And he's going to hope that you go back to the old way of doing things. And any time that you bring in a new strategy, get ready. We call it an extinction burst, meaning he's going to up the ante as much as he can in terms of whatever happened before, hoping 
that you're going to go back to the old way of doing things. So you're standing in front of the cupboard and you're saying, he's going to start hitting you, he's going to start climbing, he's going to pull your hair, whatever it's going to take and hope that you're going to give in, right? That you're going to let him, you're going to step aside and oh, help yourself. No, you're going to hang tough. And I've, I've told this to so many parents. You've got so much on your plates and you've got so many things you'd like to see better in your children. Just take one bite at a time. You will overwhelm yourself and you set yourselves up for failure if you take on too much at one time. We're all human. We can only do so much. But let's do one thing really, really well, right? And totally consistent. And once that's accomplished, then we're going to take on number two. And that's the way you whittle away at this. Remember, the most important thing that I've learned about Fragile X Syndrome is that these individuals are developmentally delayed. They aren't going to catch up with their peers. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that. But they keep moving forward. And you know this because there's things that they couldn't do two years ago you thought they'd never do that they're doing now very naturally. It's like it just happened, right? So again, they are going to continue to grow. So you have time to work in these sorts of things that you want them to accomplish. So um, let's, let's keep looking at this. this. Here's this communication. And you can see what we do to get this little guy to talk. <laughs> so again, high interest, right? He loves bubbles, and we're holding out. We're holding out for the bubble part, right? We can give him the want, and he can imitate that, but he has to initiate the bubble part. And he's a verbal kid. Now he's very verbal. And mom, I, I showed mom, his mom this the other day, and she said, why did you ever teach him to talk? Because <laughs> that's all he's doing now, right? But again, um, high interest. It's a motivator. Could be food, it could be play, it could be a video, it could be a lot of things. But you're going to hold out with that high interest to get some sort of response. So what else goes on? Um, with that, the communication is a huge piece. We also know they do get sick. And sometimes they can't communicate that. So they're going to act out. They're going to have behavioral issues. Um, they're going to have sleeping and eating issues, toileting issues maybe even some sensory integration deficits. These are all what I would consider the physical kind of array that we would see with these guys. And I think sometimes we really don't think about the fact that they could have an ear infection. They're not telling us, right? They may just be pulling, and that's about all you're going to get. Um, they may have a stomach ache, and so they're biting their hand even more, and you're trying to figure out what's this about. They just don't tell you, right? And again, a lot of them have a high tolerance to certain pain levels, and so it's really hard. So remember, when you're looking at behavior and it's surfacing, there could be a physical issue here. There could be a physical condition. There could be um, some problem with not sleeping and eating. Those are the things that you want to really think about. So again, when we look at eating, a lot of kids stuff that have fragile X, okay? That's because these receptors right here are really the best that they have in terms of kind of getting information about being full. But unless they have a lot of food in their mouth, they don't know and they don't really feel the food and they don't know that their, their cheeks are full of food. They have to be completely filled before they get that receptor and before they can feel it. And so a lot of them do that. They also explore with their hands, and so they may get their finger into the side of their mouth, and they may sort of massage their gum or do something else. That's their way of feeling the food in their mouth, OK? Because this is, this is a problem for them with the sensory piece. And so again, um, yeah, you can take it now with the yeah. black. That's fine. Oh, that, that, right. that worked out great, right? Yeah. Um, so again, you know, you have to kind of look at that piece in terms of being full. You don't want them to stuff and then choke. That, that could be very dangerous. And we have kids that are older that are still doing that, that we have to do a feeding program where they just put a little bit on the plate, they eat it, they swallow. Another little bit on the plate, they eat it, they swallow. Again, kind of a long process, but it's worth kind of helping them along rather than having that finger in there because when they get older, that kind of grosses out their typical peers, and they don't want to sit by them. They don't want to eat by them because they're, you know, I had one kid, and I, I said, why isn't anybody sitting by him? He's a great kid. 
And this little girl piped up and she said, have you seen his glasses? He has his lunch on his glasses. Because he's like this and then he goes like this. I mean, you know, because he's adjusting his... And she said, it's grossing me out. Well, I kind of had to give her credit because at least she told me what was going on. You know, I didn't like the answer. But <laughs> anyway, so then I kind of went back to that and I thought, well, okay. This is probably could be replicated anywhere. And if this guy gets old enough, people are not going to want to be with him. He's got a great personality, a wonderful sense of humor, but he's going to lose out because of his hygiene, because of his grooming, because of his eating. So again, these things are important um, for us to teach these individuals. So no longer do we allow that to kind of be in the mouth and stuff, but get him on eating programs and feeding programs. So this little guy, um, again, uh, he, I'm going to see him actually in, in Sydney, I think. Uh, and he, this was a while ago, so he's now 17. So that's kind of fun uh, to look at these guys and remember the, them from a while ago. But um, eating, just to kind of reconcile this, have you made a list of preferred and non-preferred? We know these guys typically like things that are high carb. They just do because they're easy to chew. Um, they tend to like it better than something that's really kind of hard, like meat or other things to chew. But I will say, as I travel around the world, a lot of kids learn to eat vegetables and fruits, even though it's kind of hard for the palate and kind of hard to chew, because that's what the culture provides them. And I think so I've learned that we can certainly sort of adapt some things right along the way. So even though we like the mushy or the carbs or the pasta or the macaroni and cheese, we can also introduce those fruits and vegetables and get them on an equal plane. So again, I think that's something really important. Stuffing food, just looking at their eating habits. Have they choked before? Because we know these guys never forget a negative incident, right? So if they've choked on a certain food, you're never going to get them to touch that food again, right? True? I mean, has it happened to you? Okay, I, I've had a kid that talks about a Mexican restaurant every time that we're even close to, to that restaurant or any time he sees the logo because he got sick there one time. Well, it wasn't food poisoning. It just so happened that he was getting the flu. He will not eat at that place again. So again, you kind of have to go through this and, and decide what is this about? You know, did he get sick there? Did he choke on that food? What is it? Again, the neurobiological in underpinnings we want to really pay attention to because it dictates some of the behavior and some of the eating and the sleeping and the toileting. So let's talk about sleeping. Sleeping is tough because when your kid doesn't sleep, you don't either. <laughs> and you're ready to go crazy, right? I mean, it makes us pretty, pretty irritable, pretty edgy. So again, um, consistent bedtimes for sure. Uh, routine, and I really like to use um, some real strong sorts of social stories or a schedule so they know the routine. And a lot of times we write a social story about what's going on or what went on that day so they can process it. Because we know that these guys often process a lot of things that went on in their day, but they're not always talking about it. They may throw out a little snippet here, a little snippet there, and you're trying to piece it together. It's like, what? What really did happen? And hopefully we have school to home notes from teachers that go back and forth because that really does bridge then that gap and parents know what happened and then the next day teachers, you know what happened the night before and you can kind of talk about it. So it's kind of a good thing to do. So again, um, social story about sleeping, a bedtime, that can become the bedtime story. So again, you're not necessarily, um, the social story is not necessarily about going to sleep, but it's more to help them go to sleep by telling about what happened in their day. And you can piece that together from uh, a variety of resources. Quiet room, not in the parents' room. And I know, guys, I've heard this a lot. It's the only way I can get sleep is I bring him in and I put him in his sleeping bag beside our, be our bed because otherwise I cannot get any rest. I've got to go to work in the morning. I definitely understand that. I definitely get that. But we're not setting the right habits up for this child because this child is always going to over-habituate sleeping with mom and dad or sleeping on the floor next to mom and dad. And you know how easily they do. I mean, they really do habituate those patterns, and, and that gets to be pretty tricky. So again, trying maybe in the summer when they're not in school, um, that might be a time where you can start to, to do that. Maybe if you're on a vacation, I hate to ruin your vacation, but if we can get a couple of um, weeks in 
where you're trying this out and you don't have to go to work the next day, it's really, really important. Sometimes a nightlight, we have those also, a sharper image I think makes them, where you set them and let's say his wake up time is 6 a.m. It starts to get a little bit light at maybe 5.45 and it gets lighter and lighter and lighter and finally by 6 the light is completely on. It's a nice way to transition into that sort of, you know, not waking him up at, at 6 o'clock. Music that, that has a timer that shuts off at a certain time, sound machines and uh, anything of relaxed attending to the child. And I know you're going to walk in there and say, I am cr going crazy with this. I've got to go to work tomorrow morning. You've got to go to sleep. You know what happens with these guys, right? I mean, they definitely feel that emotional strain and they're going to carry that into their sleep that's not going to happen. <laughs> they're not going to sleep. So they're going to be upset. They're going to know that they upset you. Um, all of that's going on internally. So again, trying to be really neutral about that feedback. The whole family is stressed when one individual doesn't get the sleep they need. You may even have more that don't get the sleep they need. And so again, trying to carry on, go to work and do the things that you need to do when you're sleep deprived is really tough. And it's also tough for your kid. So again, try to get into a routine where we've got this established. The routine itself is calming and settling for individuals with Fragile X Syndrome because they know what's coming. They can kind of relax about it. They can look forward to the next step. Toileting, really important because most places close the doors as your child gets older and older if they're not toileted, right? And independently, hopefully, um, one of the things that we know about this is um, it becomes a social issue for the older guys. Sometimes they smell um, and sometimes, you know, uh, there's a problem with wiping because the texture of the toilet paper uh, sensory, it really bothers them, right? So again, trying to find the right toilet paper, believe me, we've worked on this. A lot of people have asked me about that and also those wet wipes that mess up your drain, but they do say that there's some that you can actually flush. Sometimes those work a little bit better because they're softer and it's not as, um, you know, with the, with the wet on them, it kind of does work a little bit better for the sensory. But again, that's a really tough one. And usually it's because of that. Usually that's the big reason that they'll go, they'll independently toilet, they'll have their bowel movement. That isn't the issue. It's afterwards not wiping. And then that's where the smell comes from because then you have tread marks in the underwear, right? And there's a problem with that. Um, that fecal matter, matter does smell and it just causes them, then nobody wants to be around him and so it goes. So it's an important skill. It's something that's really important to develop. And if you notice the smell, um, then you need to kind of help them with a way to wipe that's going to be more um, efficient for them and that they can tolerate. So again, um, sometimes we do it too soon. Remember, it's a developmental disability. I'm not sure. Yes? I've got a couple of questions. Should, do not use so much I think maybe at the end. At the end? Yeah, I think that's better. Okay. Thank you. Um, so again, let's look at um, really what's going on physically. Because sometimes that sphincter muscle in the butt uh, hasn't developed them up. We know that they have low muscle tone. And so if we start it too early, we're going to have a problem. And we're going to frustrate them and frustrate us. Um, so again, if you've noticed that they're kind of noticing that they're going in the corner and they're squatting and they're doing those kinds of things, or if they're older, they kind of get embarrassed about it, so they might be going in their bedroom and then, oh no, I didn't, mom, I didn't, you know, I didn't do that. Well, that's part of this problem here. Uh, but they may really have the low muscle tone and that sphincter isn't developed enough yet and they really can't hold it and release it at the time when they're on the toilet. Sometimes it does just automatically come out. So again, make sure that's intact. Um, does he not like being wet or dirty? That's a good sign if he's sort of pulling it himself or he's trying to hide to do it. That tells you he knows that he needs to do it and he's probably doing it wrong or doing it in a way that's going to get him into trouble. So again, that's kind of what, what you're up against there to kind of judge that. Does he have accidents frequently? Um, and does he go to a private area? So again, some of those training readiness questions you have to ask. And so normal, the normally developing kids, maybe three years old, they're starting to do this pretty consistently. Your kid may need another two years to really get to that point where it's developed and he's ready to go. He may need to be seven. But again, it's something that you're gonna wanna work on. And you'll know whether or not, if you're really consistent and you really try, 
that child will, will get trained. If you've been consistent and tried and it's not working, chances are it's too soon. Okay, so you kind of just remember that. Uh, motor delays, that's really a tricky one. And that's, again, based on neurodevelopment. It's based on the anatomy that we talked about early on with the brain. There's some real problems with motor planning. And when you think about it in your development, it's really, yeah, that's not, you can take that. It's back of nobody's, yeah, it's okay, because nobody's really, you can't identify the kid. Um, they try really hard to draw. They try really hard to take notes and write their names. And sometimes it's just a bunch of scribble, isn't it? But they want to do it so badly. And they also, especially if they're boys and everybody around them is doing a lot of sports, that's really tough for them because they really can't do it. They can't participate. They're not good at it. Their motor planning, their low muscle tone causes them not to really even like physical activity sometimes. So again, you've got that all going against them, and that's really tough. It also plays into self-care, brushing your teeth, you know, combing your hair, dressing, buttoning, snapping. All that motor activity is so difficult when you're trying to move toward independence. So again, those are things that we know and I'm just telling you this to, to help you understand, we know this from the science. This is going to be difficult, so don't get so frustrated. You know, they're going to get there. They truly are. It's just a matter of having the patience. Um, okay, so sensory integration, I know we've got some OTs in the audience. We know that that's a big deal for these guys. That poor nervous system of theirs just gets overwhelmed and overloaded and kind of shuts down. Um, kind of shuts down on processing any demand that you might be making. Um, the hyperarousal, the triggers for those, sometimes the, the environment, the noise, um, smell, taste, touch, any of that can send them, on, and sometimes more than one of those. Um, and then that lack of internal processing, um, then they shut down and they can't think. They can't use the cognition that we know that they have. And so oftentimes when we're saying, you know, I know he knows that. I know that he can answer those questions. But let's say it's in a loud environment or it's in some, some environment in the classroom where he's shutting down because it's really difficult for him to pay attention. You're not going to get the answers that you could get in a relaxed environment or in a, in a structured environment. Again, um, the regulation, the fight or flight, all of that kicks in. and They have a miserable time trying to attend in that situation. And remember, a lot of times they're okay for a, a little while and then they accumulate all of this anxiety and this arousal and then they totally lose it because they're trying to hold it together for a while. So again, um, you can see what happens here. Uh, there's a real disorganized state. Uh, there's a reduced attention and modulation and regulation. All of the things that are so difficult kind of get in the way related to this hyperarousal. So we see anxiety and hyperarousal sort of intertwined. So again, they're trying to deal with their anxiety and they live with this all the time. Can you imagine being anxious every hour of your life? It's tough, right? I mean, I'd be ready to throw things too or hit somebody. And they don't know why because that's all they've known. So again, that then leads to this hyperarousal when they're trying to regulate and they're trying to pull it together. They're just off the charts in terms of the arousal level. So when you're experiencing the hyperarousal, you try to adapt to the situation, as we said before. So they're cleaning up a mess, and the water just keeps pouring out of the pitcher. And they keep wiping it up, and then it's pouring out. And they're having a heck of a time in terms of that cycling and that worsening of the behavior. And remember, they get embarrassed about things. So again, it's a problem for them. It's a problem for them to clean up the mess, so to speak, and still feel OK about what's going on and being redirected. Um, so again, um, it has a clear biological underpinning. Um, and again, it's really important to understand that we have some accommodations that we can use to help with that. And those of you that have worked on eye contact, please stop doing that, <laughs> unless it's a social language goal, right? That you're trying to get somebody to look at you, to talk to you, or at least turn the direction of the speaker. That's all I ask. If you need to wear sunglasses for them to be able to look at you, that's fine too. So again, when you're talking to somebody and they're like this, a kid with Fragile X, you're going to train them to just turn to where the speaker is. 
but they don't necessarily have to provide the eye contact because we know from research that's harder for them than other populations. It seems to go right to their soul and it's very scary for them to give that eye contact and that's when we see hyperarousal a lot of times, don't we, when we force those sorts of things. Um, navigation, sometimes that works, you know, they're very good at navigating through their phones and they can figure a lot of things out and so instead of a map, for example, they might use Google and a lot of them try to use Google and sometimes their articulation is so poor that they can't really get the point across, but it's good because they're starting to use an alternative device. Again, physical illness, we talked about that, communicating the illness and the motor delays. If we look at um, the emotional responses to anxiety, we know that a lot of times they yell, um, they get pretty mad, they curse, they do lots of different things when they're very aroused. Um, aggressive, obstructive, um, and destructive. Um, they don't like to make mistakes, but they might fail, they might get embarrassed, they may be socially very shy at that point, they pull it all together, and then sometimes they'll abuse, they'll do more hand biting and those kinds of things hitting their head. Uh, so again, that's their emotional response to anxiety. What can we do about that? Well, structure, um, give choices. Those are the kinds of things that you really need to have in, in your pocket. You've got to be ready to pull that out and know, okay, he's over, he's very anxious, he's over aroused, I've got to figure out a way to introduce the structure. So I'm going to give what I call forced choices. So I don't care which one he picks because they're both okay with me and I'm gonna give him two choices. That brings down the anxiety level a little bit because it's not imposed on him. It's not something that um, he feels that he has to make, you know, that he has to do what you're asking him to do because at that point in time, when he's hyper aroused, he's not able, remember, everything shuts down. And so again, we're trying to get him off that mark and into something that has more structure. So these two choices would work for you. Um, Predictability, so a schedule of some kind so that he knows exactly what he's going to be doing. Um, that really is very helpful. This is for a higher functioning child. But again, on Monday, this is what's going to happen and so forth. You can use picture schedules as well. This is um, a little guy that gets totally overwhelmed with change. We know that change is difficult. We know transitions are difficult. Again, they're going to have a stronger reaction to change, um, change in schedule personnel. They have a problem with a new aide or a sub or those kind, we call them guest teachers now. Is that what you call them? <laughs> Isn't that kind of, whatever. <laughs> I don't know, that sounds weird to me. I just want to say, have a sub teacher in there, but they want to have a guest teacher. But they really have trouble with that adjusting. Yes. And then when they get connected, because they're really much better with adults than they are their peers at certain points of their development, then they get attached to that person. And when that person is gone, or they change classes, um, that's really hard for them. So again, you need to ready them for those changes if you know them. Um, and again, the consistency um, in terms of that um, autism piece that we know a lot of those kids get stuck on this kind of thing. These kids are even more um, uh, really affected by change than even the ASD population. So again, uh, remembering that. So this is, I talked to somebody about this. I've um, sort of talked a lot about introducing a question mark. So what we do is we have a question mark that signals um, individuals that there's gonna be a change in the schedule, okay? So you have your regular schedule up, and every day at nine o'clock, let's say, you're gonna put the, the question mark up, okay? And it's gonna be taught to this child um, as a change. Okay, oh, there's a question mark. When you see the question mark, that means there's a change. So I'm gonna take the question mark down, and I'm gonna put up going to grandma's, okay? We don't usually do that on Saturday at nine o'clock, but that's what we're doing today. So again, that's gonna be the same thing every time. Or maybe it's, you know, we're gonna stay in our jams or we're gonna go walk, take a walk with the dog, something that you can replicate to let him know this is something that the question mark stands for. And it's something in his repertoire that he's used to doing. Then you're gonna move that question mark different times of the day, okay? And they're gonna start seeing that. And I've, I've been in classes where we've done this. So we go through the daily schedule and there's that question mark. That's the first thing they wanna talk about is the que question mark, question mark, question mark. Okay, that's right. There's a question mark up there and I'm gonna tell you what that is. First, we're gonna do this, then we're gonna do this, and then there's a question mark. Oh, what's behind the question mark? So I peel off the question mark on the Velcro and I see that up there is maybe a, a 
speech therapist that isn't going to be there that day. And so instead of that, he's going to do something else. So we've already readied him for the change in the schedule and the change in the routine by teaching the question mark. And it really works very effectively because you've given him a signal so that he can pay attention to that and he knows what that means. It's not just a change, right? Okay, so anxiety, we have lots of remedies. A lot of times we'll do a calm down routine where they sit on the chair and they have to put their feet in a certain place and they fold their hands and they squeeze. So co-contraction to their joints, you know, that's really what deep relaxation is, isn't it? Because we squeeze and then relax because it really feels good and then relax. So again, those are some of the remedies. We do the strategies for the breathing, right? So again, did you need that last slide up again? If you do, I can put it up. Do you need it? Okay. Um, so again, you know, you're going to um, take those breaths and you're going to count to 10. Those are all good things to do for calming. This is the smell the flower and blow out the candle. That's a really easy one. And you can use the props because you, you really can, you know, a fake flower. And now we're going to get the candle. Helps them understand that breathing process. Um, feelings, just knowing them, just knowing where you are with that. Uh, really important and a lot of times they can identify them but then they really can't in real life right so again you're going to have to reiterate that I've got a 30 year old that lives in Chicago that we're doing a scale so one through five and we always are going to kind of throughout the day where are you what number are you okay and he's heard it so many times I'm a one okay now you're starting to feel he's getting a little agitated so you check in with him again you know Doug what what number are you Mmm, I don't know. I think I'm a one. Really? A one. Well, your face is red. Now, so we have all of these things that kind of help him judge where he is. And we put it into a, a scale, like this one, um, so that he's able to give you an idea of where he is on the scale. And sometimes he really can't identify it, so you have to help him do that. But this is a good way to self-regulate. Also, um, you know, just using any kind of calming down for sure. If we know that short-term memory is problematic and if we know that that gets in the way of learning we need to provide better uh, way to structure the task so let's begin with red and then we're going to get to to yellow and then we're going to get to pink or whatever those colors are that are up there um, that gives them some sort of structure so they open the drawer and they have something to do in that drawer and this is independent work so that they can work on their own, but there's structure to it. You see what I mean? You're not just giving them some worksheets or a puzzle or whatever. They know, okay, I'm going to go to this one. Now I'm going to remove that tab and I'm going to put it over to the done section. Now I'm going to go to the next drawer and I'm going to remove the tab, put it over the done section. And you're going to move the um, worksheet over to the basket that work is finished. So again, it gives more structure and they really get into this because it's, you know, it's a lot easier to kind of follow that structure. Then maybe they can go to a table and they can go around the table and do their tasks that way independently. That helps with attentional control because you've given them specific tasks and they move from one to the next. And again, maybe their task board says that they're supposed to do um, number two first and then number four. That's exactly what they're going to do related to that task. So they follow that along. Um, checking things off. We talked about that before. They love that. I use this in work environments too, where they've gone in and let's say they're older kids and they have a, a task sheet that they're going to look at and, they're, and we can change it all the time depending this was a kid that worked in a, in a um, uh, restaurant. And so when the produce came in, he had to unload the produce and take it in the cold storage. So it didn't come every day though. So I had to be able to change his schedule, his work schedule, so that we could accommodate what was going on at the job. So he knew to go to that task and he just, it was on a whiteboard, he just checked it off, then the next one he checked it off, so it went. So again, this is just one thing that continues to help them stay focused and grounded. Now, executive functioning we talked about before. That's a tough one. How do you get him started? I want you to watch this video. This is a very, very skilled teacher with a child with Fragile X syndrome. And you'll watch him. It's math. So math is tough anyway, right? Because it's sequential. And they don't think that way, OK? Reading, we can kind of get over the hump because we can teach whole words. Math is tough. Um, so again, she's helping out and trying to get him uh, to start um, count, to put, put numbers in order, OK? So watch what she does. It's really amazing.
So here he's spinning the numbers because he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know how to start. That's executive functioning deficits. That's that frontal lobe that's causing him a problem, right? He's not doing this to be bad. There's how she got him started. Okay, two yeah. errors in a row. One, Here we go. Two, three. Where is number five? Where is number five? Thank you. Where is number six? Where is number six? Thank you. Six, seven. Seven. Okay, this is, this is a classic. It's wonderful. It's just a wonderful clip because she knows how to change things around to make it work. She didn't attend to the head slapping. She did not um, because this is so much better than the way he started in the first place. And really, when you think about how she, I think the next slide kind of goes over it, um, what she did to remediate that executive functioning, the strategies that she used, rhythm, right? She started tapping the table. It kind of got his attention and got him motivated. We know music. We know singing a, a song or something that's a directive kind of helps if we use some rhythm. Um, he, a lot of times she kind of got him started. You know he didn't, want to, he didn't want to be corrected, right? So she moved this couple of the numbers back, and that really put him over the top. Again, he was embarrassed. He didn't want to get it wrong, and it was hard for him. It is hard for him because numbers are tough. But again, she persevered because she was doing sequential, and it had to be put in that order because that's numerical order. Did you see anything else that she was doing that you thought was pretty helpful to him that got him going? Something about the stimuli? So she put out a couple of numbers to start with. She kept pulling back so that he had a forced choice, maybe only two. So she was helping him be successful, right? Um, that was really important because she was orchestrating the stimuli in a way that he couldn't mess up too much more. Okay, then when he kind of got on a roll, she put more out so that he was dealing with more. She did the tapping. She did the singing. She changed her voice intonation. Did you notice that too? They like that. Have you noticed they love accents? Um, they can imitate accents beautifully, right? So that kind of was the glue that kept him motivated. Again, really nice way to get through the executive functioning deficit and get him started. Again, the environment is critical. Those visual timetables, consistent routines, boundaries of work areas. There are some kids that need that boundary and we just put the blue tape around where they are and where they work because they don't want the unpredictability of somebody coming up too close to them, hitting them in the back, lining up. Big deal to these guys, right? They want to be way ahead of the crowd because why? They don't want somebody to hit them from behind because they don't like that unpredictability. They're always hyper-aroused. They're looking around hyper-vigilant. They want to see who's behind them. They want to be way ahead because they don't want to be activated by that worry and that concern that somebody's going to touch them because they can't interpret that touch from behind or in a, in a situation where they're not aware it's going to happen. And it happens a lot when kids line up. They learn that real quickly. So again, they're the line leader, but they take something with them so that they're going into gym and they're going to carry in 
a, you know, a, a basket of balls or something to the gym. And they're going to have that special job because guess what? They love helping, don't they? They love cooperating. They love having a special job. So here you go. You're going to kill a few birds with one stone. You're going to have them at the front of the line walking way ahead because it's appropriate because they are taking something into the gym, right? You're going to load them up with heavy work so that they can get ready for that transition and they're going to take it into the gym. So you've really done a lot with that and you've created a job for him to feel happy and, and feel good about himself. Opportunities to assist, we just talked about. Fast pacing presentations are important because kids get lost in the shuffle. So waiting is really hard for these guys, terribly hard, because they're anxious. Who likes to wait when you're anxious, right? So again, um, that becomes problematic. If we keep the pace going, then they don't have to wait. You don't get as much opportunity for them to get into trouble, so to speak. Um, interact socially, they really need that. And when we're placing kids when they're older in job situations, we always look for a social component. It's really important because that keeps them engaged and happy in their jobs. When we look at um, high interest, that's key. I've written so many articles about high interest. It's the glue that keeps them focused and motivated to continue to try. So again, novel skills. They kind of like that. We kind of feel like, well, wait a minute, that's something they're not familiar with. Is that really right? Should I be doing that? I thought they need the structure and the predictability. They do, but they also love something novel. So if you pull something out of a bag, they're always looking to see what it is, and that's a good way to bring in a new lesson or to bring in a new word or to bring in something that you want to teach them because it's going to get their attention because it's novel. Um, also interests that... Um, kind of help neutralize the full impact of getting a new skill going. So again, if you're going to be teaching a word and it has to do with a high interest level, that's going to help them get into a new system of learning or a new vocabulary. Side dialoguing, we talk a lot this, about this a lot. Direct instruction is very difficult for these guys. They feel like they're under attack. It's hard for them to have you doing the direct instruction. What number? What number? ABA a lot of times, unless it's toned down, that's hard for them because it's that direct kill and drill kind of stuff, right? So again, um, you're looking at more of this kind of indirect. So I always talk about a triad. So I've got a kid that's typically developing or another kid in a, in, in a special education class, and we've got the guy with Fragile X, and we've got me. And I'm going to ask this guy a question. The guy with Fragile X is going to answer that question every single time, right? But if I ask the guy with Fragile X the direct question, he's going to drop to the floor. He's going to hide his head. He's going to go crazy, right? So again, that indirect triad. And then the side dialoguing is really a good, good additional sort of thing to introduce where, let's say you and your husband are talking about what's going on this weekend. And you know if you had a conversation with your son and told him all about what was going on or your daughter with Fragile X, they're going to get pretty anxious about it. They're going to be pretty nervous about it. They're going to take everything in at once, and it's going to be overwhelming, and they're going to shut down. But if you continue to do the side, you know, I think on, on Saturday we might go down to the food market because they have an outdoor market. I think that might be kind of fun to do that on Saturday. What do you think? You're going to have that conversation through the week a couple of times, and guess what? They're going to overhear every word of it, but they're going to integrate it and hear it because it's not a direct conversation with them that they have to worry about. So the indirect gives them more information. They're nosy, aren't they? They pick up on things you can't believe it. You're on the phone saying something to somebody, and later on it comes out in the open, and they've overheard it. So again, indirect, indirect, um, kind of puts them off, and they don't have to worry about having the direct shutdown overwhelming them. So again, just these are a number of different things that you can do with high interest. Um, make your own boards. Use sticky notes and go through a, a book that they like and have the vocabulary and have them stick it and match it to that particular word that's in the book. There's just a million ways you can do this. Watch this video. It's really interesting. Um, and I will give uh, time for the questions here in a minute. This is a little guy who looks very anxious. And you'll watch how I try to redirect him. Is it, um, be, is it going to be a giraffe or an elephant? Elephant. elephant. It's a giraffe. Oh, we got a giraffe. Okay, ready for this? Oh, this is a funny one. Okay, elephant. Ready? Very impulsive. Very anxious. A bell. So I'm trying to slow him down. We have this one. It's a fish. 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 It's a
ready? What do you think it's going to be? Good job. What's it going to be? An elephant. Elephant, you're right. It's an elephant. It's an elephant. And this one is a cat. Cat. Let's look at these. Ready? First, sorry. Giraffe is on. So he's using a token board. Here, giraffe is on. Okay, good, good. Ready? So what I was trying to do is he would have just shuffled through those really fast and he would have put them in any, any place just to be done because you saw how anxious he was. So I'm trying to slow him down. I'm trying to get him to respond in a way that's much slower than he would normally do to start, start to build in that sort of weight, that sequencing, that timing that slows him down a bit. So again, um, it really calms the kid down too because if you just let him be frenetic, it just spins off the next and the next and the next in the cycle um, in, in a way that's, that's not productive. What's it going to be? So math is concrete. It's sequential. The way to kind of take a look at this is using the math equivalence board. I think Wendy has some for um, the, the group to, to look at. Uh, we can look at equals and we can look at ways that these uh, numbers are the same. You notice that we have um, some of the, the blocks there and that two blocks equals two blocks. You have to make each side look equal. Two blocks equals two soccer balls. So again, we're going from the three-dimensional to the one-dimensional. Two blocks equals the numeral two. The numeral two equals two and so forth. We've got money. We've got um, digital and analog clocks. Um, visual supports. Sometimes on the run we have to make these up. So go ahead and use a whiteboard. Go ahead and use some 3D three ring binders and we have those two that we're going to do with the lucky dip. Um, sometimes it's just take something in a manila folder. If you're going down the hall with your kid and you're in class and you've got to make it work to get him there, you're going to do something like that. Um, sentence schedule, photograph schedule, just depends um, on their level. Um, and in the long run, you, you hear all this from me, and you're like, oh, man, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> what am I supposed to do first, you know? I, don't, I, I just don't know what to do first. And again, you don't have to go set this all up right away to be a good parent. Um, do you want to tackle the sensory dysfunction? You may not need to set up a sensory lab in your house. You may not need to restructure your basement to be a sensory lab. You don't maybe need to do the curricular adaptations all at one time. Maybe you have some different expectations of him behaviorally. You can't do it all at one time. So again, I think what you have to do is that you have to look at what's getting in the way of his functioning the most, okay? Is it hyperarousal? If it is, well, then let's look at that. If it's a behavioral issue, let's look at the function of that behavior. Why is he doing this? What purpose does it serve him? Sometimes. It's to avoid. It's to escape a situation. So if they tantrum enough, they don't have to go with you to whatever you're doing, running an errand, right? They're, you're going to figure out a way to leave them at home. So again, what's the function? Instead of saying, this is a terrible behavior and I've got to get rid of it, well, yeah, that's probably the end result and the outcome. But in the long run, if you figure out the function, why he's doing it, what it gets for him, you're going to be in a better place in the long run to remediate that behavior. So again, don't try to do it all at one time. Um, try, to, try to relax about it. And then I, I want to leave you with something I think is really, really cool. This is written by a mom. And get your tissue out because it's pretty moving. But I think it gives us all hope. Um, the X at the end of the tunnel. When David was two years old, he woke me up at one, or 4 a.m. every day. And I was weary all the time. When he was 12, I had to wake him up for school every day, and I wasn't tired anymore. When David was three years old, he couldn't say an, any more than one word, and I despaired. When he was six, he said four words together, and I celebrated. When David was four years old, he threw up at parties, and I was embarrassed. When he was 10, he only threw up when, when he was sick, and I happily cleaned up. On the day of his diagnosis, I thought my life and his life had ended. Now, I think his life and my life will go on after all. 
So again, I, I'm just sharing that because I think she very put it very well, didn't she? That um, there are things that you go through with your kids and teachers and, and therapists that you go through with your kids and you think, oh man, I don't know if I can do this another day. I don't know if I can come to work tomorrow. I don't know if I can be his mom another day or his dad, right? And yet, because it's a developmental delay, those things will indeed change and all your hard work will pay off and you just have to kind of hold on to that because it's critical to your welfare and your child's welfare. So again, there's a lot of people that have experienced this and truly um, you do get through it and you do see those, those changes. So now I'm going to um, address the questions because we have Jonathan coming in. We have a break after the questions and then Dr. Cohen will be coming in. Okay. You've got quite a few. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. 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 So um, the first question is: um, I have a twelve-year-old doing relatively well. For example, very verbal, reading, riding bike, social. Yet frequent poop toilet accidents, sometimes two to three times a day. Better on schedule, but still not great. Check stomach x-ray, stool tests, tried diet changes such as dairy and gluten-free. We've tried a lot of positive reinforcement, etc. over the past 10 years. What should we try next? Okay, so um, this person is having lots of, lots of bowel movement accidents. Art, do you mind me asking the question of whoever texted? Are the bowels loose? Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't, I, we were trying to keep this sort of anonymous, so yeah, you'd be willing to ask. Are they really loose bells? Um, they were before we tried gluten-free, and that's okay. firmed it up. So that's helped that part. It's easier to clean. Yes, yes. Um, but it's still an issue. Is, is it happening at any certain time? Have you tried to figure that out? Um, a couple of times in the morning, I normally try and get him to go to the bathroom like 30 minutes after breakfast. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're successful, but then sometimes he'll go to the TV room or something and do it immediately before or after that. And then sometimes at other times throughout the day as well. So no predictability in terms of he eats and then has to go or no. he's getting ready to go somewhere and he's anxious and goes, nothing like that. Not really. Okay. So you've checked with everything gastrointestinally, he's fine. Okay, then I think the next step is, and I hate to put a burden on you, but I would really track exactly when it's happening during the day. If you can keep a calendar and do a week, just do a week, don't overburden yourself. And let's see if there's a pattern. Um, you're saying there isn't, and there, there probably might not be, but sometimes we think there isn't, and if we write it down, and maybe, have you done that? Exactly the time of day? Okay, so maybe the time of day and the activity that comes before and after, I would kind of keep track of that. We may see a pattern of something going on where he needs some attention. We may see a pattern where he's anxious about something happening. We may see a pattern that he's um, digested some food. Maybe he's even had something and you didn't know about it. I don't know, does he go help himself to food? Oh, have you? Okay, well, that's probably good, though, because if you're really trying to sort this out, you have to know whether or not it has to do with something he's eaten. I would look for those patterns, and then I would look to the day and the time of day and interrupt it. If, if Let's say roughly it's happening between 10 and, and, let's say, 9 and 10, okay, in the morning, and we see it happening, you know, 9.15, we see it happening at 10, whatever. I would preempt that. And I would definitely get in the way of that and say, you know what, we're going to go to the bathroom together. Let's go in and do it. If you can see that there's a pattern, if you preempt, a lot of times you have a better chance of being successful and reinforcing him and not getting down that negative trail. And I know you try not to be negative, but he's also probably embarrassed about it too and he doesn't like it. I'm sure he doesn't. Um, he may not act like it, but I bet internally he doesn't like that. But then he's gaining something from that as long as everything's taken care of you know, his anatomy isn't, there isn't a problem with anything, then I think you need to take the, kind of look at the schedule, look at when he's doing it, and then preempt ahead of time and take him into the bathroom and then, you know, give him all, does he have special underwear? Has he, have you tried that kind of thing? Um, I really tried that. He doesn't care to get that dirty or not if it's special or has he superheroes. Said that he really didn't want to do that, but, uh -huh. I mean, it's quite firm, I believe, that he, like he's doing it. I think when it's loose, you can't necessarily control it. Mm -hmm. But now we're pretty 
Monthly. When he's awake, I, I agree, there's something else going on. And so to me, that's when you've had everything else checked out, we have to look at the function mm -hmm. and whether or not he's getting some sort of negative reaction, some positive. We don't know until we track it and then see what's happening before and after. I would try that for a week, see what happens. Okay. Okay. Would you mind please elaborating on schedule training? on toileting slide, is there a right or wrong in this process? Okay, so <coughs> toileting schedule, and again, you wanna make sure your son is definitely old enough to be toilet trained, there's no question. Um, if you have a younger son and a child, you've asked about this question, we wanna make sure that everything is working okay for them to be successful with toilet training. So again, looking at the schedule, you have to commit, I mean, I will have to say to you, there aren't too many people that fail at toileting schedules if they stick with them, and it's heck. It's heck because you're going to be doing it every hour or you're going to be doing it at whatever you, you decide. The way we figure that out is we take a baseline, and the baseline tells us how many times a day that he's urinating, okay, or that he's having accidents and about when they are, okay. Then if you see, oh, he, he kind of, it's like maybe every, I don't know, four hours, something like that. So you're gonna put the, him on the schedule of every three hours, right? Because you're gonna wanna be successful and you're gonna have to dedicate, you can't go to work that day. I mean, it's gonna be a weekend, it's gonna be a summer vacation, it's tough. But you have to do it consistently so that then you can train in um, this scheduling. So again, usually it works if you commit to that. And sometimes if you have like a four day weekend, I know with Labor Day coming back up, something like that, sometimes you can do it over those three or four days. Uh, but again, you have to commit to it. So it's like <laughs> you have to set the alarm and you have to go to the bathroom at this time and you have to go in and you just sit there. He doesn't always have to go, but you are putting in a, a training schedule so that he knows that that particular time he's going to be going to the, to the training process. Okay. Um, at school the other day, an aide said my grade six child has peaked and now all downhill. I understood that fragile X's are lifelong learners, where can I get info to school so they understand? Wow, yeah, well we're gonna work on it, aren't we, Wendy? We're gonna work on some modules so that um, we can get these modules out and also do some, I think, written sorts of, of flyers. Um, peaking, mm -mm, I would never say that. With, well, I wouldn't say it for any human being, frankly. Um, I think that especially with Fragile X kids, um, to say somebody had peaked and now there's no more progress in store, is that's a slippery slope to me. Um, I definitely would kind of forget that statement and I would do everything in my power to continue to help this kid learn. Um, I think the literature is there. Um, you can go online, you can, you can go on my website. I've written lots of articles. Um, there that are downloadable and free. So it's www.marshabraden.com. Um, and just go in and look for materials and you'll see lots of articles. There's many on anxiety, there's many on instructional modules. Um, and again, you know, take that in and um, let your teachers know. And it's not every teacher that would say that for sure, because I know we've got guys that are dedicating their evenings and we appreciate you being here. Thank you for that. Um, but again, I would never make the statement that somebody's peaked. I just don't believe in that concept at all. We use melatonin to help our daughter go to sleep. Should we consider using routine and other strategies and wind back the melatonin? Um, I think the melatonin is important. Um, what I understand about melatonin is it sort of gets them to sleep, but it doesn't sustain sleep. And so again, maybe the schedule coupled with the melatonin um, would be a good way to go. I think that routine at bedtime is really critical because what we know about bedtime with these guys, they're so connected to us, you know, they're social beings. And when the end of the day comes, everybody kind of gets quiet, it gets dark, there's no activity, there's nothing to hook them into us as parents. Because remember how they like to keep us involved with them, right? They keep talking to us, they get us to talk back, that kind of thing. That's how they manage their anxiety because they want that connectedness. And so if you're talking to that child, you're connected to him, he's not as anxious. And so at bedtime, everything settles down. So if we have this routine that's very predictable about sort of bringing him down from all the stuff that's going on and, and the chaos to, um, to a point where he's ready to settle in or she is to go to sleep, 
then I think that's really important. And the more we structure that in terms of a routine, the easier it's going to be for them to settle in because it's predictable. They know what's coming next. Uh, those, I tell you, the social stories at night are really wonderful because it sort of just calms the brain. And they're going to be thinking these things anyway, so you might as well kind of get it into a story and go through it. So um, today at school, um, John went and uh, visited uh, a nursing home. And when he was there, he saw a lady who he served juice to. And the lady said thank you, and he had such a nice day. And then he went back to school and he did this lesson or whatever. And then he came home and we had such and such for dinner. I mean, you can just write that out really quickly. And now he's going to go to sleep because he had a really good day and he's able to rest and relax. Nice bedtime story, talks about the day. He goes through all of it in his head. It's done, it's over with, and he can settle in. They work really well. And again, I think anything that you can do to, to keep that routine going, get them ready for bed, they know the routine, the predictability. Routine helps anxiety. Any of us who are anxious, it really helps, doesn't it? Because you're predicting things. Um, you're able to know what comes next. You don't have to worry about it. And all the research around routines tells us that it's really good. Uh, for kids on the spectrum, it's good for kids with Fragile X because it's dependable, reliable, and you can settle in and relax because you know what it's going to be. When a child gets aggressive, we tend to decrease the demand to help them feel more in control and help them to calm down. However, by doing this, we are not reinforcing the message that when you find something challenging or you're embarrassed, all you have to do is hit out to make the difficult activity stop. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question um, because you're right. Uh, a lot of times behaviorally, uh, when somebody's getting ramped up, we like to sort of ramp down, right? We like to lessen the demands because we think that maybe that's going to allow them to engage and sustain. And so again, I think um, what you have to do, I, I really like the token board for that, frankly, because that gives the contract, so to speak. The kid knows exactly what he's going to have to do until it's over. So he's going to have to do five tasks, OK? What I like about the token board is it's not always one for one. So he does a problem and he gets a, he gets a token board or token. It's more about, oh, I'm kind of losing him. So I'm going to up the ante just a little bit more with that token. It's going to come a little sooner because I want to sustain him. You're still in control, right? So the expectation is more about how much I think I can get out of him, but I'm going to keep the contract the same. I'm going to go ahead with this five um, tasks that he has to do, but I'm going to kind of finesse it a little bit if I see him losing it. So he's still going to get to the end. He's still going to get reinforced. But the bottom line is I have control over it as mom, teacher, dad, whatever it is. So I think that's a good way to kind of look at that. So you're not really decreasing the demands, but you, you kind of are, but you're in control of it, right? So you're still going to continue on. You're still going to get that much done, and then he's going to get reinforced at the end. Does that make sense? OK, are we? Okay, maybe so let's do one more. Oh, OK. Um, this was an apology for someone who um, thought this was the adult seminar. Oh. <laughs> that's OK. Uh, for you. Um, do therapy sessions work better outside of home due to them knowing the boundary of work versus home better? How can you address that need for indirect teaching once they are an adult? Okay, so therapy, I think for adults, one of the things that I've found to work really, really well is group therapy, uh, social skill development. I give them assignments to call one another. They like to text instead of call. A lot of them don't answer their phone, and it goes to voicemail. So I'm trying to get over that piece that you have to communicate with people if you're going to have friends. We also go in the community. Um, we get the menu ahead of time so that they can make the choice, and they have to stick with it because they get into the restaurant, and it could be an eternity, especially the girls, before they make a decision on what they want to order. You know, you could go crazy waiting, for, waiting that out. So, okay, nope, you're going to pick that, Shannon. That's what you said you're doing, and that's what you're having. And when I whittle that down, I say to them, what's so hard about that? I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake, right? Isn't that just typical of making a decision? We're all going to kind of fold at times where 
we're afraid we're going to make a mistake, we're going to, we're going to order something we don't like, and we're going to look next to us and somebody has something that looks really delicious and we wish that we'd ordered that. So we go through that whole process, but one of the nice things about the group is everybody kind of has their own deal, right? Everybody's got something going on, and it really works well to get them together in a group, and, and that's their friends. Um, many of these kids, as an adult, that becomes their friends and the people they hang out with and they make plans with. So I think that's a really good way um, to, because especially after school and everything is done and they've graduated and now they're sort of out on their own, they don't have that opportunity to get those friends going like they did in high school. Um, and I think it's a really good way to do that. So, Wendy, we should take a break, right? Okay. It means it doesn't mean we're going over time. I think we're just adjusting, adjusting our time. So I okay. No, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Um, our daughter has random coughing fits and vomits after meals. Is this common? Okay. Um, yeah, I've seen it a lot in girls. Um, I, I think it's all related to anxiety. I really do. Um, and I know it seems like it's connected to the food or something as long as, do you mind me asking who that was? Okay, thank you. Um, you've had everything checked out in terms yeah, of the physiological. Where, uh, probably about four years, probably four years, and had her Right. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think she's probably afraid of choking. Um, you know, that's pretty scary. Um, and so she's overgeneralized that. She's habituated that to. Yeah, yeah. And so now she's going to have to get it out. Um, does she have nasal drip or anything like that, do you think? Does that happen? Okay. Is she on an anti-anxiety medication? She's actually a very happy little girl. Yeah. She's very social. Um, we're currently put her out for today's seminar because most of the seminars are predominantly based on males. Uh -huh. Very true. She's a very social little lady. She loves going out. She loves being at restaurants and eating, mm -hmm. meeting people and at school participating. So I don't think it's more based on that factor. Um, we're just trying to figure out if it's, it's a common thing for her. Well, usually it relates to something that's happened in the past and their fear of choking to death or not knowing how to clear their throat or something's going on that's making things pretty uncomfortable for them and they're trying to fix it and sometimes they get to the point where they just have to vomit it out because it's the only way they think they can get rid of whatever is causing them to feel the coughing. Do you think it might be something to do? Because one thing that I have noticed, she can't blow her nose. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know how to blow her nose. Yep. She sucks it in. Probably. Yep, yep. Yeah. So, Bev, when have you done work with that blowing nose and kind of getting bed, Bev? Yeah, I've seen it. Um, then vomiting, which is because she can't blow their nose. It's quite a complicated task to actually blow your nose. It is. Certain airways and force the air out of somewhere that air normally comes into. And if she can't shut off those airways, that's probably what's causing that sort of panic and anxiety, and that's why she's vomiting. That's the only way. To clear it out, yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's very. I, I think that's very good because she's obviously having a hard time getting rid of something in there. And oh, except for us, <laughs> we're special. Yeah, I think that's the key. And you know what we know with girls: panic attacks are pretty common. Um, and it, it's like everything seems okay and they hold it together really well, but there could be one 
thing that really sets the stage for that panic. And once that starts, and even if she is into a panic attack while she's trying to fix this, you see she can't breathe, she's going, you know, her heart's racing, all of those things that are very scary that she may not have even shared with you. Um, I think that's what we're dealing with. And it's, it's very interesting because girls can cover that up really well, um, but they do come up with that, that panic. So you might want to consult your physician about a panic attack and see if that might help her. I would sure work on the blow in the nose, too. Sorry, you have. A question? Uh, the uh, granddaughter is, is doing exactly the same thing. We found out she was lactose intolerant. Lactose. Intolerant. She was, you know, be vomiting little bits and phlegm type and mm -hmm. coughing some of the food she's eating. And that went on for a couple of years and, and we tried all sorts of things and then we had it tested, it was lactose intolerant. She stopped that and we watched that now. She drinks not, uh, you know, the lactose free food. She's fine now. So that's good. That's She's why we get together. Time. Yeah, good. I think another important point, Marsha, is that we've been talking about the lack of resources about around about girls who have bad boys. There is, seems to be an enormous amount around boys. So while Marsha's here, we're looking at creating some some short written materials and uh, a video as well. Yeah, because it's true. You know, the girls are kind of forgotten, aren't they? Yeah. Do we have okay, more? You oh. Do you have more? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I keep popping up. <laughs> um, when a child gets into the cycle of repeating, um, how do we get them out of it and avoid, get, and avoid getting sucked in? Mm. They're really good at that, aren't they? Because we've conditioned them. So they start to repeat something and we say, yeah, that's right, that's what we did, blah, blah, blah. Did we do that? Yeah, we did. So again, you're reinforcing that re repetition over and over again. And a lot of times I'll just do something really concrete. Um, we're going to talk about that one time, okay? So then that's the one time and then I start to ignore it. Um, the only way that you can really get rid of some of that, and it's, it's just a byproduct of the anxiety, um, and then try to turn a direction where you might talk about something else. So we start to get some variety, or you can even frame it for them and say, you know what, I think you're kind of anxious right now. Um, depending on the functioning level, the reason I know that is, um, you can say to them if they're higher functioning, is because you keep talking about the dog over and over again. So I think you're kind of anxious. Let's talk about something else or get to the bottom of why you're repeating something over and over. Sometimes it has communicative intent and other times it's just strictly to get rid of the anxiety. So it's that repetition over and over and over again. And then when we connect with them, again, you see that's that, that connection. Uh, communication brings us close together because they've got our attention and they're connected to us. So they're going to talk, 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 and we're going to talk back. If we kind of can turn that around to say it seems like you're anxious, it seems like you're repeating yourself, or you start to ignore that and move on to something else. You know what? Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about what happened today when I was driving the car, blah, blah, blah. And again, if they don't want to engage with you, then that pretty much means that it was something to do with the anxiety that's created um, and the need to kind of stay connected, just that need to repeat and stay connected. So I would try it one of two ways. Higher functioning, say it seems like you're kind of anxious right now. What, what, are you, what are you worried about? What's going on? You know, because you're repeating yourself. So you're just framing it. That's all you're doing. Or to try to connect them to a different uh, conversation. Marsha, can I just yeah. go to Yeah, go. I have a young student who um, we actually printed out a picture of a rubbish bin. And I said to him, the first time you tell me that, I'm really interested in it. But any time after that, it's got no purpose anymore. We can throw it in the bin. And we'd write these phrases or words that we'd repeat. And once it was written on the bin, we never heard it again. That, yeah, that's a good, and I've done it with sticky notes, and I've said, okay, we'll talk about that later, let's put it up here, and then let's put it up here, we're going to talk about it later, and the later comes, and we have a designated time, they don't want to talk about it anymore, so it's a, it's a really good, good way to kind of, because I do think it's an anxiety thing, you know, it's just something to fill the air with, it doesn't have a lot of good communicative intent, so to speak, yeah.